Well, praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome to the worship service here at New Beginnings Ministries of Peoria. I'm Pastor Martin Johnson. I'm so glad you have tuned in the broadcast with us today to be able to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Uh, I do want to early on want to say happy Father's Day to all the wonderful fathers out there for the amazing job that you do. And just want to let you know, I hope that you are appreciated and celebrated on today. So I'm going to ask for those of you who are listening uh, to make sure that you love on your fathers today. Uh, I've been blessed with a, a good father. He's going on to be with the Lord. But I think and I praise God because I am who I am because of God's love towards me and blessing me with the father I have. So for all the fathers out there, happy Father's Day. Uh, I hope you feel all the love the, the, this day that it'll bring in uh, as we appreciate and applaud God for the role of fathers. Uh, I want to invite our attention uh, today. I want to move right into the word of the Lord on today and want to invite your attention to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, as we move quickly into the word of the Lord. Um, I know some of you probably got some plans to do some things uh, with your family, so we're not going to try to be long and try to move expeditiously through here. But want to invite your attention uh, to the word of the Lord on today from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. And the word of the Lord reads to us, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. And the word of the Lord is blessed in Jesus' name. I want to use today for a very uh, brief topic as we celebrate uh, Father's on today, God's man, uh, God's man. In today's message, I just really want to draw our attention on manhood as we celebrate and applaud the so many fathers who are sacrificing and trying to do the best they can. And uh, it appears to be in the tumultuous uh, time that we now find ourselves in. And so today... I'm just going to try to lift from this passage of scripture that I read before you three quick biblical principles uh, on what it looks like in being a man in this world that impacts the environment and give others hope in the time and the day that we now find ourselves in. Because the reality is, is that we live in a world in a day where society is sending out so many mixed signals on what a real man should look like and what a real man is. And, and so it's important as we look into the text on today, uh, Paul here, who is the senior to uh, Timothy, he instructs the younger Timothy and what it means to really be a man in this world. And Paul here, he writes him not just to let him know what it means to be a leader or to be someone who's in a position or in, in, in a place of authority. But Paul here, uh, he gives us to understand what it really means to be a man. And in this text here, as Paul points out, he shows us three principles of what a real man looks like. And the first principle I want to pull out from the text is Paul, he shows us the importance of knowing your true identity. It's important because uh, who you are is the question that, you know, many times as men we wrestle with, who, who am I, God? Who did you create me to be? And even as we look at others and what we would consider successful individuals, and sometimes we compare our lives to their lives, and, and so we wrestle with that of, of who are we, God? Who did you create me to be? And, and here it is. Paul, he lays it out early on in giving them to understand who Timothy is. And it's important because if a man does not know who he is, he will look for his identity in all of the wrong places. And so Paul, he, he writes to Timothy here in the text, and he begins the text this way. He says, but you, O man of God, it's important now, he, he calls the younger Timothy, he says, but you, O man of God. What he does here in the text early on is he affirms Timothy's identity first, and then based off of his identity, he gives him instructions that are relevant to his identity. And all I'm simply saying in this is that when you know who you really are, you realize God has a plan for your life, and you can't live your life recklessly, but you understand really and truly that your steps have been ordered by God. And Paul here, when he calls him a man of God, Paul is giving us to understand, brothers, here early on, uh, he's stressing to us the importance in understanding as a man 
And knowing our real identity begins with God. Because if we're not careful and we're looking at our culture, we're looking at those who we would consider successful or those who we, you know, we see them and we say, man, I wish I was like them. I wish I had what they wanted. Sometimes we are now pursuing culture instead of our creator. And we'll find our identity in the things that we try to do. And we'll get lost in doing all this other stuff that God has never called us to do. And even though we're doing it, we're living a life most frustrated. And we can try to find our identity and trying to get, you know, all the money and trying to get, you know, cars, houses, clothes, all that stuff. And some of us, sometimes culture has taught us, even growing up, um, how many women you can have, you know, define who you were as a man. And it's important because if a man does not know who he is in the mind of God, we will find ourselves looking for our identity in all of the wrong places. And that's why we hear about actors and athletes and so forth, and they, we consider them successful, and they have all the money, they have beautiful women and all this, but yet on the inside, they're still empty because they don't know who they are in Christ Jesus. And it's important here because the older Paul, he writes the younger Timothy, and he tells him, he says, I don't want your real identity to be lost chasing the things in this world that society will try and tell you what a man is. And you need to know, just like Paul tells Timothy here in the text, that you are a man of God. That when we repent and we give our life to the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't care what you used to do, I don't care what you used to be, you are a man of God. Please understand this, that as a man in this world, just like they did to Jesus by saying Hosanna on one day and the other day they said crucify him on another day, People will place titles, they'll put you in positions, and they'll sing your praises one day, and they'll say you're successful, and you're all that, and you will think that you have made it. But can I tell you, just as quick as people will give you titles and place you in positions, you're going to experience some moments in life where people will call you a disappointment, they'll call you a failure, you'll fall down sometimes, and sometimes you may even find yourselves going on the other side of the law and being called a felon. And I don't care what your past may look like. I don't care how many degrees you've got. I don't care how many times you're falling down and you get back up. The good news for us is that in spite of all the good, the bad, the ugly that you and I will go through in life, there is a God who still loves us, flaws and all, and he has a plan for our lives. And Paul here, he wants you to understand that you have to know where your real identity comes from. And it comes from God in a time and a day. And everybody's trying to get us to go on that side and this side and trying to put an identity on us as men. We have to know who we are. It's important because uh, when, 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 when Paul here, he wants us to understand that you have to know where your identity comes from because if we put all of our life into our job and then our job lets us go, what are we going to do as men? What are we going to do? Would we give everything to the one that we thought that we were going to marry and it didn't work out? What do we do as man? And I want you to know that when you know who you are and you know whose you are and you know your real true identity begins in God, then I walk with the revelation that God has a plan for my life. And God, he can take all of your present flaws, all of your past failures, and he can use it to make you stronger, to make you wiser, to make you better because you're God's property. You're God's man. There are going to be some days where we're going to have to take some L's. For those of you who know the Bible, you know the scripture says God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. And there are going to be some days, brothers, that we're going to suffer some losses in this world. And when you remember that you're God's man, it's going to help you get back up, even though you're falling down and you don't think you can get back up. But when you know who you are and whose you are, 
God gives us something on the inside that makes us get back up. The wise man Solomon said it this way in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. He says, for a righteous man shall fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Okay, if you didn't get it like that, I'm going to give you the message translation. You can understand this. The message translation said it this way. He says, no matter how many times you trip them up, God loyal people don't stay down long. Soon they're up on their feet while the wicked end up flat on their faces. Brothers, you just need to look at your current situation, whatever it is that you're going through. And sometimes you need to speak a word over yourself and you need to prophesy to yourself and say, God created you to get back up in him. I know we live in a time and we live in a day where, where people are subscribing to Ancestry.com trying to find out where they came from. But can I save you some money and tell you that from the ancient of days, God's word says in the book of beginnings, Genesis, that we were created in his image, in his own likeness. And so Paul here, he tells the younger Timothy, he says, if you're going to be a real man in this world, first you need to know that you did not come from a monkey. You did not evolve from chaos. You did not come from a geographical place of bondage, but you were in the mind of God before you were formed in your mother's womb. And Paul here, he's telling us, brothers, it's important for you to know your identity in God. Secondly here, what he does here in the text, he points out, he says, it's for a man or God's man is to maintain his integrity. Because he begins to define integrity in verse 11 by saying, flee from these things. And in the proper context, because I tell you a text without a, a, a context is just a pretext. But when you understand the context from verses 8 through 10, it's talking about the love of money and greed. And Paul tells Timothy, he says, flee these things because some have erred by the faith. And what he's literally saying is that if you want to maintain your integrity, that you have to flee from some things. And I know as men, as, as brothers, we don't, we don't like to run. But Paul here, he, he tells the younger Timothy, as he's given him wisdom, he says, you're going to have to flee some things. And the word flee here, it means escape. It means to run away and to get away from something as quick as you can. He literally means that as a man, there's going to be some things, there's going to be some stuff that comes our way and comes at us, and our best strategy is to run, to flee. You don't have to talk to yourself. You don't have to do all the pros and the cons and trying to weigh things out. All you need to do is flash deuces and get up and out of there. I remember in a situation as, as, as I was a babe in Christ and I was, we were, I was stationed in the military and, and we had all these uh, uh, young, young couple groups within the churches and so forth that we would care for one another when uh, our different ones would deploy as, as a community uh, of believers, we would come together and make sure that, you know, people's needs were taken care of, that um, they had food and just, you know, taking care of things. And one particular uh, um, time, um, my wife deployed to Germany, and um, so I was left behind. And then there was another individual from our, our uh, shop that we worked in in the military that deployed with her, and his wife... Um, they had just got to the base, so she wasn't familiar with the city or anything of that nature. And immediately her husband uh, was called to deploy uh, with my wife. And so they took off. And, you know, so I'm trying to, you know, tell uh, uh, the wife that I was like, everything's going to be all right. I'm going to be in conversation with my wife on a daily basis. So if you need to get something to your husband, let me know and I'll tell my wife and she'll pass it on and everything. And as time went on, um, I was working, um, and she came, she came to my, my workplace. And so, you know, the first time I was like, okay, nice to see you. God bless you. 
Um, we're going to take care of things. And then the next day, she came back to the workplace. And so I was, you know, I'm, I'm young in the faith, and I'm young at this time. I'm, I'm only about 20 years old, so, you know, still sort of trying to process out life and don't have the wisdom like I have the wisdom now. And so she kept coming by. And then one particular time, um, and this is why I said I didn't have the wisdom or anything of that nature, um, she was like, well, it'd be nice. I don't have anyone in town to, you know, uh, uh, go out to dinner or anything like that. And in a small town, everybody knew everybody, and I wasn't trying to, you know, do nothing on, on the side or anything like that. So I went ahead and obliged and just helping her and getting her acquainted to the area and to let her know that I was a friendly. And so as, as we took her home, and then she says, you can come in for a minute. And so I didn't think at that particular moment anything like that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm young and dumb, y'all. So this is, this, is my, this is my moment. God is good. And so in that, though, I went, and then she brought out a photo album, and uh, there was a, 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 um, a beach in Europe that was a nude beach. And so... She gave me this photo album. She's like, this is some of the military pictures. So I'm thinking we're going to be looking at airplanes and, you know, different Air Force bases and, and everything because that was our culture. And then when she brought the photo album out and she began to show me that and something on the inside was like, it's time to get up and it's time to run, get up and out of here. And I thank God I told her, I said, I got to go. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I got to go. And, 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 and I share this with you, not because I'm saying that I was all that and I was strong, but I'm talking about as a man and some of the situations that we find ourselves in, in our humanity, even though that I was a babe in Christ, loved God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, loved my wife with all my heart, my mind, and my soul, the temptations that the adversary will place you in, and God will always provide a way of escape. And so you, you got to know that when you're in those particular situations, uh, when you're tempted to go back to what you know God has called you out of, you got to learn how to run. That's your best strategy. I'm getting up out of here. I ain't no shame to my game. I don't care what you say. I love God too much, and I love my integrity with God that I am an ambassador for Christ Jesus. Because the scripture also says, there has no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. But God, who is faithful, will with the temptation, he'll allow you and give you a way of escape. There's some stuff you just got to run from. Because sometimes, let's just be honest, you can't trust yourself in some situations. And you need God's help. You need his grace. And he's saying that the Christian life here in the text, he says, it's not just about running away from stuff either. But he says, while I'm running away from something, I'm also running to something, Timothy, because the B clause of the text says, and pursue righteousness. So Christianity isn't just about us avoiding certain things, but it's also about us pursuing the right thing. It's, it's a picture of you running away from something, but you're also pursuing something called righteousness. When I was in that situation, yes, I love my wife, but I was pursuing the righteousness of God. I knew that was wrong, and I knew what was right was right was for me to avoid the very presence of evil and to get out of there. So when we're running away from what we consider to be wrong, we're running towards that which we know to be right according to God's word. And righteousness, it means being right with God in doing the right thing. Because long story short, it means to live our lives, not trying to impress people, but living our lives to be pleasing to God, to be God pleasers. And so literally he's saying to us, he says, I want you to know your true, your real, your genuine identity. I want your life, secondly, to be a life of integrity. And last but not least, he says, I want you to live a godly life. Because he says, follow after godliness. And a godly life is expressed through our relationship one with another. I often say, I can tell how my vertical relationship is with God, how I interact with one another on a horizontal level. 
And whenever my vertical relationship is off, normally it's going to offset my horizontal relationships. So how I treat folks is an indicator of how my relationship is with God. And it's important because in our lives as men where we can live out our God-given lives, there are two areas that I want to talk about and then I'll be right out of your way. The first one is it's our relationship with women. Because for a long time, there's a teaching that seems to elevate men over women. And scripture doesn't teach that men are better than women. But on the other side, scripture teaches us that we are all equal before God and we are valuable before God. We all have unique roles that we're both valuable to God and we are created in his image. And so how I treat my wife, how I treat sisters, how I treat women, it speaks volumes about my relationship with God as a man. And I have to, you have to treat women with respect. The government is trying to legislate what's right and what they're really looking for are godly men who would rise up and live out what God has called us to be. Godly men don't disrespect women by calling them out of their names and dishonoring them. When you look from the very beginning of time and going back even to our identity, our integrity, and now pursuing the righteousness of God, what it looks like in living a godly life in Genesis, God puts the man Adam to sleep and he pulls out of Adam a bone, a rib. And he forms woman and he brings Eve to Adam. And Adam says, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. And you know the story for the sake of time as they go on that they are married and God ordains the institution of marriage between Adam and Eve. And so when we talk about being God's man and being a man of honor, a man of integrity, every man must understand that marriage is honorable. We're living in a time and a day where marriage is on the decline. And the thought is, because of our culture, just, just get as many as you can get. And then when you get tired, go ahead and tie the knot. It's sad, it's pitiful because we have not raised up young men to understand that when you're dating, you look for that one that you can be committed to for the rest of your days of your life. Scripture says, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and he obtains favor of the Lord. When you find her, you, you, you make a commitment that you're going to love her, you're going to serve her, you're going to spend the rest of your life with her till death do you part. And now we're living in a day where we dishonor our women. And we don't marry them. We don't do what God instructs us to do in his word. But if I'm going to be God's man and walk in godliness, I can't follow the culture I got to follow my creator. I got to do that which is right in his sight. I've got to honor his creation. The second thing, and I'm almost done here. Not only is it about the relationship, brothers, with our wives and how we honor, how we respect them, how we love them as Christ also loved the church. But it's also about our relationship with our children. This is how we live out our godliness. When I talk to my kids on the phone, I always end the conversation by telling them that I love them. Fatherhood is it's not just about making the baby, but it's about being there. It's about guiding them along life's journey and along the way. And even when they feel that they have outgrown you, still being there to help guide them, to support them, to be able to give them words of wisdom and the counsel of God. 
fatherhood, it, it means being their provider, their protector, uh, their priest until they enter into that relationship with the Lord. I, I was uh, speaking with uh, one of my daughter's friends, and he was talking about the next step. And, and I told him about the seriousness of, of dating and even looking at marriage. And um, he says, I, I, I love your daughter. And I said, okay. Um, I said, but I, I want to let you know. And I said, I tell this to anybody who's, who's dating her um, to get my blessing. I said, right now, I said, my role is I'm her provider. I'm her protector. I was like, I'm her intercessor. I'm her priest. And I said, until you can do that, you'll never get my hand. I said, because that's our role. And so some would say, oh, pastor, you're trying to be old school. And no, 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 no. I understand my role as a father, as a husband, as God's man. And being able to bring them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord and to be able to set the standard in the earth realm. And that you just can't treat God's property any kind of way. And so I said, if, if an individual isn't at that level, then now I've given them something to aspire to. And I don't just say you got to figure it out. I say I'm here to help you get there if you want to get there. But if you're just looking for someone to say, I want your daughter's hand in marriage, and I'm going to say, okay, you got the wrong dad right here <laughs> because it's my responsibility in living a God-fearing life and representing Christ. Um, you don't have to, you don't even have to have biological children. God has called you as men to be able to speak into the lives of this generation. We have to realize as brothers, and I'm closing here, we have a difficult job before us, but God's hand is on us. We're all works in progress, and we need the grace and the strength of God every single day. I'll be the first one to admit we don't have all this figured out, but we're doing the best that we know how with the help of God. And so through the text, uh, hopefully I try to lift up just three very quick principles before you on today and what God is requiring us as God's man. And what a God's man look like in the days that we're living in. Man who understands his identity is in God, the integrity, and also to live a life, a God, a life of godliness that reflects the very likeness of God in our lives. Every man, I don't care who you are, if we'll be honest with ourselves, we, we need someone to look up to. As a pastor, I have another pastor that speaks in my life, a spiritual father. I remember as a kid growing up, I, I looked up to Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan um, not only because they were great basketball players, but we all share the same initials, MJ. And a couple of weeks ago, during the, uh, the sports drought that we experienced with this whole uh, coronavirus, we all had the opportunity of watching the last dance with Michael Jordan, the GOAT. But today, I want to encourage every man that's listening today to look to the ultimate GOAT. And that's Jesus Christ. He's the model of what a real man looks like. When you talk about identity and knowing his identity, he knew exactly who he was. He knew exactly what he was called to do. When you talk about integrity, the Bible talks about even as he walked this earth, he was in all points tempted like we were, but yet without sin. And even when you talk about godliness, his life was an example for all that followed him. That he's the light of the world. 
And now because he's the light of the world and his spirit dwells on the inside of us as believers in Christ Jesus, as, as Paul told Timothy, man of God, the Lord is instructing us as men in this turbulent time that we're living. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. It's important. We are in a critical, critical day. In a time of race wars and political wars, and as men, we're being challenged to take sides and to stand up, to speak out. I don't know about you. I'm not minimizing the things that are going on in our world or even uh, the part that we play. But I want to be God's man. I want my identity to be found in Christ Jesus. That I'm not taking sides, but I'm understanding I'm a kingdom man. That we have been called to the kingdom for such a time as this. Not to represent the world, not even to represent our culture, but to represent Jesus Christ. So I challenge you, my brothers, if you're looking for a man, Jesus is the man. Father, thank you and I praise you for this moment in time to allow us to be able to articulate your heartbeat to these men, Father, and just to encourage them and to speak to their hearts, Father, and what you have called us to in this particular time that we're living. I pray even now, God, that you will allow them to be the father of their house that they need to be, that, God, you will give them the strength even to be the man of God that you've called them to be in their homes. Pray that you would give them the compassion, the patience, even to be the husbands and the fathers that you have called them to be, Father. And I pray that uh, even as life has bounced them around, pray, Father, give them the tenacity, Father, to get back up again in you, Father, and to do the things that you have called them to do, Father. Keep their hearts encouraged even now, Father. Allow their hearts to be in alignment with your will in this time and this day. That we would be your man, God's man. We ask it even now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. We pray that the word of the Lord has blessed you. We love you and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Praise the Lord, everyone. I trust that all of you are staying home, staying healthy, and most of all, staying connected to Christ during this time. As we continue to share a word of encouragement throughout the coming weeks, we want to remind you of ways you can still give your tithes and your offerings during this time. As many of you may know, we have still been able to be a blessing to our community during this time, and it's because of your continued faithful giving. Remember, the Word of God tells us, Give and it shall be given unto you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. When we take care of God's business, He takes care of ours. That being said, there are several ways that you can continue to give and to be a blessing to others during these challenging times. We still have our online giving. You can go to our website at www.nbministries.net and click on give. You can also text it. You can text to give. Just send the amount that you would like to contribute. If it's $10, $25, $50, you would just put that amount in with the dollar sign 25.00 as in $25, to number 309-455-4267. That number again, send the amount to 309-455-4267. It will then send you a link and prompt you to follow the instructions to allow you to set up to be easier the next time you try to text to give. You can also download our app, NBMOP. 
from Google Play or the App Store. I truly encourage you to download our app anyway because you can get, gather much inspiration uh, and listen to past sermons on that app as well. So that's NBMOP and go to the Google Store or any of your app stores to download that app. And then you can go old school, snail mail. You can mail that donation to NBMOP, New Beginnings Ministries of Peoria. Make sure you make it attention to the financial finance department. That's 3201 Northeast Madison Avenue, Peoria, Illinois, 61603. That's 3201 Northeast Madison Avenue, Peoria, Illinois, 61603. And let me remind you, please do not send cash. This is our prayer for you on this day. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. May God bless you. Amen.